。嗨，大家好，可以听到我的声音吗？如果可以听到我的声音呢，那欢迎大家在我们的对话框打一个一，让我来知道一下。好，那好，谢谢大家。嗯、呃，大家可能今天看到我的这个视频有一点点奇怪啊，因为我现在我是在这个室外，因为现在我家的网有点问题，所以呢，我只能是在这个室外给大家来主持今天的活动。但是呢，我今天呢，并不是这个我们活动的主角。<笑>呃，那么我们，我相信今天我们所有的这个观众朋友都非常的熟悉，我们现在呢正值这个呃这个亚裔传统月。所以呢，我们今天这个活动呀是非常契合我们这个月的主题，所以我们请来了来自于这个 UCLA 的这个教授 K K 老师，也是我们的老朋友啊，为大家来讲一讲我们这个华裔呃美国华裔作家的这样的这个一些英雄谱，让大家来熟悉一下，在美国的华裔作家他们创作了哪一些文学的作品值得被铭记，然后值得向大家来推荐的呢？那么今天呢，我们这个话题啊，就是啊，非常相当的有意思了。那么这个我们今天的这个主讲嘉宾啊，包括我们的主题，稍后呢，何老师会给大家来具体的介绍。那么在我们的活动开始之前呢，我还是按照惯例给大家来介绍一下我们今天的活动的这个要求。首先呢，在您进来的时候啊，您的这个视频和声音默认都是关闭的。如果您的视频和声音呢，它在过程当中不小心开启，请您默认关闭。呃，我们还是想让我们这个 K K 老师啊，今天在一个比较这个不受打扰的环境当中，给大家来进行今天的讲座。那么另外呀、啊，今天 K K 老师他所这个可能会提到的一些作家，那么今天呢都是在我们的这个观众的行列里面啊，所以我们今天的观众里面是藏龙卧虎。那么稍后呢，可能 K K 老师会提到的一些作家呢，他们就会来打开呃这个他们的话筒来给大家来进行这样的一个互动和交流，所以呢也请大家敬请期待。那么按照惯例呢，我们还是在这个活动即将结束的时候啊，就会留给大家一部分的时间来进行这个交流和沟通。所以呢，如果在我们整个讲座过程当中，如果您有什么话题，还有这个问题想进行互动的话，那么欢迎您把您的问题还有话题打在我们这个右下方的对话框。那么在这个活动即将结束的时候呢，我们的这个这个主持人会代表大家来向这个我们观众朋友来进行提问。但是因为呢，我们今天的这个活动可能稍微有点点特别，因为今天的 K K 老师是将用这个英文来进行讲座，所以呢，一会儿在我们互动的环节呢，可能是这个英双这个中英文啊、呃，这个来双语来进行的，所以呢，这个如果说对双语不是特别呃。Maybe we、uh, lost the Liu Chang. Uh, can I, uh, can everyone hear me? Ah,、uh, 能听到吗？能听到吗 ？Okay, 呃，刘畅，那我来吧。Okay, 好。Okay, ah,、uh, hello everyone. Ah,、uh, welcome to this special lecture. Ah,、uh, since our lecture today, ah,、uh, is going to be conducted in English. So let me ah、uh, give my introductory remarks in English as well. So our event today is、uh, special. For two reasons. First, we are in the midst of the Asian American and the Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and the literary contributions made by prominent Chinese American writers is certainly an important part of the American narrative.、Uh, in order to celebrate these writers, we need to know who they are and what they have written. So it is for this purpose. That we are offering this lecture. So the second reason that today's lecture is special is that we have a special guest speaker, Professor Zhang Jingjue of the English Department at the UCLA. Professor Zhang is the foremost scholar in the U.S. on Asian American literature in general and the Chinese American literature in particular. So she has written extensively on this subject. So the books and the articles we listed on our website and the flyers <laughs> are only a fraction of what she has published. So what is admirable about Professor Zhang is that she has not only taught and written about Chinese American writers, but she has also kept herself in the forefront of fighting against racial injustices for Asian Americans in many ways. 
At this lecture, Professor Zhang will introduce close to 30 prominent uh, Chinese American writers. So some of, some of them are with us today and uh, we'll be meeting them when they are introduced. So we are in for a real treat and a feast today. Now let's welcome Professor Zhang Jingjue. Hello, thank you so much, He Yong. Uh, thank you, Dr. He Yong and the Renmin Institute for this fabulous opportunity for me to share my appreciation of 28 Chinese American writers in conjunction with the Asian Pacific Heritage Month. My criteria are totally personal, not based on nativity, linguistic medium, the number of awards garnered or Asian American sensibility. Trained as a Shakespearean, though never taken seriously as one, I just happen to enjoy reading these writers the way I enjoy reading Shakespeare. On account of the art of telling, its ability to make us realize that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy, and therefore to enable all of us to be more empathetic creators and creatures. But obviously I haven't read everything. And therefore apologies for if I, I'm sure I inadvertently omitted many, many writers. I want to share both what all these 28 writers have in common and how unique each one is by quoting their own words. What the writers have in common is writing themselves and America uh, Americans of Asian descent into existence. 60 years ago, the term Asian American or Chinese American did not exist. Without Asian Pacific writers, we would still be regarded as merely inscrutable Orientals in the real world. Is there a problem with the video? <laughs> no? Okay. This problem of invisibility is not confined to the Americas. In China, Chinese immigrants and even their offspring are regarded as overseas Chinese or Huaqiao rather than as Chinese Americans. There are also moral prohibition and forbidden topics in many Asian countries resulting in the self-repression and the suppression of family stories and personal desires. Can I show the PPT? Sure. I have therefore organized this talk around the theme of breaking silence. I will discuss the authors in triplets to highlight the common characteristics and share with you one detail, a line, a quadrant, a haiku, a word image from each author that has left a lasting impression on me. I'm confining myself to living authors because I want them to know how much they are appreciated when they are still in their prime. To me, as long as they are writing, they are in their prime. I will start with three luminaries who incorporate Chinese classics such as The Ballad of Mulan, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and Water Margins into their fiction and drama. Maxine Hongkingston wants the Chinese audience to know that her Chinese name is Hong Ting Ting, and her Ting doesn't have a female radical, doesn't have the new radical. President Clinton gave her a National Humanities Medal, and President Obama gave her a national, uh, a national Medal of Arts. So she's probably our most uh, well-famous writer today. I remember shedding tears coming across Kingston's line, Agong does not appear in the railroad photographs. Having read how laboriously Agong toiled in the Sierras building the transcontinental railroad, Frenchin is famous as an audacious playwright and notorious for being the harshest detractor of Maxine Hong Kingston, David Henry Huang, Amy Tan, etc., etc. 
But these three notables actually have a lot in common. Young Dono, in French's Dono Duck, is also very upset that the history books in American schools do not mention his forefathers who built the American Railroad. So you see the quote here. His dad then told him, history is war. You got to keep history yourself or lose it forever. When David Henry Huang, a Tony Award winner, a Grammy Award winner, and three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in drama, saw the poster for this talk, he wrote, it must be traumatic for Frank to be trapped between Maxine and me. An admirer of all three authors, I hope to reconcile them through my devious design. David Henry Huang wrote Dance in the Railroads when he was barely older than his two characters, Long and Ma, two railroad builders passionate about acting. Huang's own father apparently also disapproved of his son's decision to become a playwright. So the line in the play could have been spoken by Huang's father. You don't know how you endanger your relatives by becoming a playwright. This play shows the commitment it takes to live the life of an artist. The second triplet are all inspired by Chinese lyrics, ideographs, or poetic forms to forge distinctive trans-Pacific poetics. Marilyn Chen is an activist and feminist and chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. The quadrant from Get Rid of the Eggs, sorry, I forgot to shift my power. Why is the phone ringing? <laughs> is the sound okay now? The second triplet are all inspired by Chinese lyrics. Marilyn Chin is an activist and feminist and chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. The quadrant for Get Rid of the Eggs you're seeing it right there. On the PPT shows how Chin rewrites Li Bai's poem to describe the plight of a dependent immigrant Chinese wife without legal status. Because Stanford just fired their only Cantonese lecturer. So I'm going to uh, read the Cantonese Li Bai's in, uh, of Li Bai's poem before reading Marilyn's uh, English reworking of that poem. The, the Chinese uh, with uh, Li Bai, the original Li Bai's poem. It's not from the same quadrant, but from two different quadrants. Yu ge bu gai yam, ying tou cui wo shen, wo ge yu pui hui, wo mu ying ling luan. And then Marilyn, the moon is drunk and anorexic, constantly reeling, changing weight. I think if Marilyn here, please turn on your camera. <laughs> Uh, I think she might be in the audience. Um, sorry, I missed the line. Um, the moon is drunk and anorexic, constantly reeling, changing weight. My shadow dances grotesquely, resentful she can't leave me. Where's the line is a source of, where, sorry, where's wine is a, source of poetic inspiration in Li Bai's poetry. Alcoholism leads to domestic bettering in Qin's poem. So you can see how different, you know, any reworking of Chinese classics become in, in, the, in the hands of Chinese Americans. Li Yongli is author of five books of poetry and a memoir entitled The Winged Seed. His maternal great-grandfather was Yuan Shikai, China's first Republican president. The winged seed, let me see. Um, the winged seed is a memoir about Lee's father, an evangelical preacher whose godlike demeanor inspires awe and respect, but not intimacy. On rare occasions, the father is capable of tenderness as when he massages the narrator's feet after their endless voyage across the Pacific. So the, the quote on the PPT. My father put down our suitcase, 
untied my shoes and rubbed my feet, one at a time and with such deep turns of his wrist. I heard the water in him through my souls. Since then, I have listened for him in my steps. The lyrical manner in which this moment is reminisced suggests its reality and its lasting impression on the narrator and me, the reader. No less memorable is Haiku on the Road by Wing Tuk Long, a Honolulu businessman. A body fled on the road, crushed by passing tanks, face in bass relief. Even though this haiku is inspired by the Nanjing massacre, the image should sear into our psyche the separate the savagery of all wars, including the ongoing war today. The third triplet comprises a unique group of thoroughly bilingual writers who speak the unspeakable through English, their primary literary medium. Speaking of history that's been erased, Hajing wrote, what was needed was one artist who could create a genuine piece of literature that preserved the oppressed in memory. For Yi Yun Li, English is her private tongue. My brain has banished Chinese. It was cru a crucial decision to be orphaned from my native language. Those Qiu Xiaolong or Xiaolong Qiu is famous for his Inspector Chen mysteries, so famous that there's an Italian wine named after him. His first love is poetry. He's also the transla translator of T.S. Eliot, especially The Wasteland when in his youth. A poem written under the guise of Inspector Chen in interpretation expresses how our identities are always framed by the interpretations of others. Quote, only by posing ourselves in the proper light and the proper position can we be recognized as being meaningful the way a woodpecker proves its existential values from echoes of a dead trunk. The next three writers have written historical novels. Let me see. The next three writers have written historical novels that straddle China and the US, revolving around a sense of home. In Helen Liu, The Road Afar, the protagonist is the historically, is, sorry, the protagonist is the historical figure Chen Yixi, the railroad foreman who later built the first railroad in Taishan. Liu imagines what was churning in his mind before he announced to the judge in 1886 his decision to leave Seattle. Life was more important than making a stand. The lives of the people were what really mattered. Without these, the law was no more than empty words and justice was no more than hollow ideals. In McCoon's Wooden Fish Songs, the protagonist Lu Kim Gong escaped to the US on the eve of his arranged marriage. This is history, this is not fiction. Oiling, his betrothed, went through the wedding ceremony with a rooster. She served the family for 15 years before deciding to move to an all women commune. But her mother-in-law begs her to stay, lest her son be removed from the Gabo, Jiapu, or the clan registry. Oiling retorts the quote um, on the PowerPoint. Am I in the Gabo? Are you? She is then told by her father-in-law, the names of daughters and wives are never entered. In Charles Yu's Interior Chinatown, the protagonist and actor recalls his father's nostalgia. 
when he steps up and starts slaying country roads, try not to laugh. Because by the time he gets to West Virginia, Mountain Mama, you are going to be singing along. And by the time he's done, you might understand why a 77 year old guy from a tiny wood island in the Taiwan Strait, who's been in a foreign country two thirds of his life, can nail a song, note perfect, about wanting to go home. I believe um, both uh, Gis Jen and William Poi Lee are in the audience. So can both of you turn on your camera if you are in the audience? Like Charles Yu, this triplet also provides an inside an insider view of growing up Asian in San Francisco Chinatown or New York Chinatown. In William Poilly's The Eighth Promise, Lee was suspended by his high school for protesting against unfair treatment of the Chinese there. His father decided to talk to the white principal. So have the quote. But the principal got up from his desk and started to scold father like a child, his fingers pointing in his face. In response, Lee's father jumped up from his chair and with his own fingers, jabbing back like in a sword fight, scolded him back. As a result of this dramatic showdown, young William was permitted to resume his study. No one could be less distinguished than Gis Jan, she said. It's hard to explain why anyone publishes her. And as for her new book, thank you, Mr. Nixon, no one is enjoying it. Don't read it. So you know how tricky is she, her advertisement for her latest book. No, uh, do not read the, the book that actually asked people not to read. Goodbye, Mr. Nixon. Um, what the quote is not from Mr. Nixon though, um, she was in her story, No More Maybe, she talks about the communication skills needed to massage the feelings of an elderly father-in-law who suffers from Alzheimer. But I believe these skills are also needed in living in a society where many things cannot be said openly. So the quote, we know how to say something true enough to hide a bigger truth. We know how to hide people's weakness, how to protect them. Amy Tan describes the repercussions of unremitting pressure to keep family secrets and hide private feelings on the psyche. I hid my deepest feelings so well, I forgot where I had placed them. In this next slide, I deviate from the triple arrangement here in pairing Sean Wong and Fabian Ng because the two are apparently blood siblings since the 1980s. To me, both Sean and Fei exemplify the peculiar Asian American sensibility championed by the IE editors. Perhaps not surprising given that Sean Wong himself is one of the IE editors. The quotation from Sean Wong's ending of American Me's captures the regrets one feels in failing to explain our true feelings to the beloved. Quote, he thinks about the women he loves. He wishes he could mark his life at each of these points so that he could come back later with the memory and knowledge of how to occupy the heart discover a sense of place, reach home, explain his love. Such regrets also pervade Feng Yan Ng's bone in which owner, a middle daughter committed suicide. Quote, then owner jumped 
and it was too late. The bones were lost, my owner was lost. How to get the bones back? Too late. Leon, the father, was looking for part of his own lost life. But more than that, he was looking for owner. The next three writers seem to be able to hold our breath with their suspenseful plots and sensuous prose. Like Damien Ng's bone, Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You hinges on the suicide of a daughter and a sister. It opens with the haunting words, Lydia is dead, but they don't know this yet. So if you haven't read, read the novel, which I've taught several times, I just encourage you to read the rest. Len Samantha Chang's title story, Hunger, is told from a maternal ghost point of view. It registers the damage done to her two daughters by a frustrated tiger father who projects all his unfulfilled ambition as a gifted violinist on his second daughter. Quote, I remember the way he looked at her, intense, prideful, the dispassionate yet hungry stare that I learned to recognize in coaches of trainers as they watch the taut bodies of their favorite how many of you, not me, how many of you tiger parents have projected all your unfulfilled ambitions on your kids? I hope you stop doing that. Um, otherwise, read this really very, very moving story, Hunger. Secret Nunes for Rwanda describes a life outside the conventional categories of personal identity. Ruana, a Polish girl, was sexually molested by her alcoholic father. And as teenager, the author has seen her running out of the house naked and chased by a naked father. Whereupon Ruana's family was shunned by the entire neighborhood, a resettlement estate in Slayton Island. But Ruana eventually find, found love and happiness as a nurse in the Vietnam War. So this is again a true story. Offering herself to dying soldiers. So here's the quote. The guys' hearts weren't in the war. That was part of the tragedy and why we lost. But the nurses, me, I gave them all the heart I had. Yeah, it was hell, it was crazy, and I was blessed to be a part of it. I don't even want to forget, I don't ever want to forget how much love I felt and how happy I was then. People don't understand that. If they did, they would be the ones who would be jealous of me. I was there. And Shirley is already on camera, so that's Shirley Lin. Thanks for coming, Shirley. The next three works, set mostly outside the United States, grapple with the imposed silences peculiar to being female, being poor, or being perpetually foreign. Like Nunes, but even more bravely so, Shirley Gyokling Lin breaks the silence of a paternal molestation. Quote, disgust and revulsion stir my memories now, as quickly as that physical intrusion had made itself felt. I understood that I should continue to lie still, eyes closed, that pretended sleep was necessary to ward off a dangerous knowledge I was not suggest supposed to have. So as you can see, it's very moving lines when you are yourself the, the subject of what you're talking about. Lisa C. not only breaks the silence of forbidden love between women, 
but also pays literary homage to Chinese women who have invented a secret language of their own. Snowflower and the Secret Fan describes two women of disparate class background who exchange love messages written along the folds of a secret fan. They use a syllabic script called Mi Shu. Again, this is historical, not fiction. Okay, they use a historical syllabic script called Mi Shu, a language developed by peasant women in the Jiangyong County, Jiangyong Xian uh, of Hunan. The narrator of this sad tale is 80 years old, and that's why she has nothing more to fear or to hide. Mi Shu, literally the female script, is the only, only written language in the world to have been created by women exclusively for their own use. Should we all be really proud of these inventive literary women? In Peru's official chronicles, Chinese immigrant history has long been suppressed. Siu Kam Wen or Siu Kam Wing helps Chinese Peruvians find a voice of their own in A Journey to Ithaca, an autobiographical novel. I want to thank Dr. Wang Kai, who I know is in the audience. If you can uh, show, show your face, uh, Wang Kai. Uh, Dr. Wang Kai, who has done valuable research on this writer during his time as visiting scholar at UCLA, for helping me with the following quote. The pigtail Chinese have toyed in the sugarcane and cotton fields and survived both the transatlantic voyage and also horrible treatment. They never lost their national identity and to the end of their lives, they have kept up their traditions, their values, their habits, but they have been less lucky with their own native names as their neglected gravestones bear witness to. Uh, by the way, Siu Gamwei is also the only writer I know who has written martial fiction, one of my son's favorite genre in Spanish. So those of you who are martial fiction fans should look for Siu Gam Wen's um, martial fiction as well. I am pairing Russell Charles Leung and Suan Juliana Wen on account of our UCLA affiliation. Of course, we are all friends, for both have top creative writing in the English department. Setting their fiction on both sides of the Pacific, the two have made good use of an ocean of bilingual idioms. Like Lisa sees Snowflower and the Secret Fan, Russell Leung's Phoenix Eyes invokes a love that crosses conventional lines. The San Francisco born narrator is appalled by the way his friend who dies of AIDS is treated by the family in Taiwan. Quote, no funeral services were held. His family were not alone in their desire not to see or hear about AIDS. In Asian families, you would just disappear. They simply could not call AIDS by its proper name. Better to keep it within the family, out of earshot. In Juliana's, in Juliana Wang's Vaulting the Sea, two Chinese had been trained for years to perform synchronized diving in the Olympic games. After reaching puberty, one diver falls deeply in love with Hai, his diving buddy, but his affection is unrequited. This is what happens during their final performance. the protagonist. He stood still on the edge of the platform. And when the moment came, he did not jump and traded one life for another. Instead, he watched High's body flail underwater 
searching for his own. From above, it looked like an elaborate wave goodbye. You just watched the Winter Olympics. Just, just imagine what it's like if two persons are supposed to be diving together and in the last minute, one person decided to pick another life. Very, very dramatic moment. I like the last two writers. I don't know the next pair personally, but they are exceptional science fiction writers. And I make up for omitting uh, Ted Jiang's photo from the poster by putting his photo on the PowerPoint. Larissa Lai's Tiger Flu, set in 2145, is a pandemic novel par excellence. Not only because the world is plagued by a COVID-like infection, caused incidentally by the Chinese uh, tiger bone wine, which is also mentioned in Marilyn Chin's uh, Mooncake Fiction, but also because it is most difficult to get reliable information during is an our pandemic age. Quote, Denison's routinely swap out shimmering flicks and tendrils of information in a desperate attempt to know and so fix the broken world. Isn't this a most telling description about our own fragmented world when every day we have to filter what is fact from rumor? Ted Jiang, um, the, the movie Arrival is the, the his story, um, the story of your life is the basis of the Hollywood movie Arrival. You, have, you can also see the poster there. Uh, but I'm not talking about that story, but another one called Liking What You See, a documentary. That's the title. Full title, discusses a form of discrimination that is still very pervasive today, namely locusm or discriminating against someone who is considered ugly. A case in point, last night a student staying with me, who is helping with the PowerPoint right now, received a text from one of the notables, quote, are you helping KK with hair? color of clothing and makeup tomorrow. Not too heavy or overly Chinese, please. Fresh and contemporary is better. So that's the chat my, my, my student got last night. As if that's not enough, he rechatted me at 11 p.m. I would avoid dark colors like black, navy blue, dark green. So I chatted him back. Hey, I'm not running for an old witch beauty pageant. Tomorrow is about the writers, not me. So you should be the one getting doored up to measure up to your seductive poster photo." End quote. Still, a notable is a notable. So I complied with his wishes by putting on a white dress I haven't worn in 20 years. Ted Young's Liking What You See is told as a series of interviews about a reversible procedure called kalianosia. The word entered the dictionary because of his story, by the way, which eliminates a person's ability to perceive physical beauty. Kalianosia, so I'm quoting, kalianosia by itself can't eliminate appearance-based discrimination. What it does, it's even up the odds. It takes away the innate disposition the tendency for each discrimination to arise in the first place. This procedure definitely beats plastic surgery for us rising seniors. Kenneth Bai Xianyong, the last author, is my favorite Sinophone writer. Born in Guilin, at the cusp of the Sino-Japanese War in 1937 and moved to Taiwan with his family in 1949, 
He is a professor emeritus of Chinese literature at UC Santa Barbara, and is also a UC colleague. I conclude with Kenny Bai for several reasons. First, he's one of the greatest living writers of Chinese fiction. And I believe Asian American literary studies must include works written in different languages so as not to perpetuate Anglo-centrism. Second, I want to encourage the Chinese participants tonight to study this literary giant along with renowned writers such as Yan Geling in the original language. Third, Kenneth Bai's Crystal Boys, published in 1983, a novel about a young man banished from his family for loving the wrong person, was far ahead of any Anglophone Chinese American works in challenging hegemonic norms. The quote I'm sharing is taken not from this novel, but from his remembrance of a comrade in arts, in sickness, and in death. Quote, Wang Guoxiang and I had known each other for decades, friends in need and indeed, constantly covering each other's back. Because we face every hardship together, we brave many hurricanes and rainstorms along our life journeys. Once confronted with demonic illness and death, however, we suffered a crushing defeat. Instantly, we were separated by life and death in the human world. I bade Wang Guoxiang a long goodbye. So sorry, I could not do justice to his beautiful Chinese. So it's my kind of a rough English trans translation. But I also want you to note my italics. It's not his italics. From this remembrance, I can tell that Kenneth Bai has lived literature, that his love for Mr. Wang is as deep as the love depicted in the Chinese drama classic, Peony Pavilion, a classic that Bai Xianyong has also revived in, on stage. It's, it's this very impressive big project of his. Whether the love depicted in Even So the Tree Shu Yu Ru Ci in, in Chinese. If, whether the love depicted in Even So the Tree is romantic or platonic is less important than the impression it leaves me that it is the deepest love possible, not just unto death, but beyond the grave. I would like to end by remembering two writers who have also left the human world recently. David Wong Lui, my colleague and dear friend, and Jeffrey Paul Chan, one of the, edit one of the IE editors and dear friend of at least 10 people in this group of writers. Literature grants the writers, their beloved, and their characters, real and imagined and immortality. Thanks to the Chinese American writers, past, present, and yet unborn, we will live. Incidentally, my last, in my last two sentences, I stole three words from David Wong Lewis, One Man's Hysteria, five words from Russell Leung's Phoenix Eyes, and the last three words from Viet Thanh Nguyen's The Sympathizer. I apolog apologies because of the number, the sure number yeah. of writers. I did not include <laughs> Viet Thanh Nguyen in this group of Chinese American writers. He's Vietnamese American. And I, I just feel free to plagiarize any author whose words I stuck in my brain. So if I, they're stuck in my brain, I feel that it's, not, it's my words, it's not their words. But you know, I plagiarized three writers in my last two sentences. So yes, back to you, Heyong. I want to leave plenty of time. That's why I'm going through it. Uh, that's why I wrote it out, because I want to save time so that people can ask me questions, but especially the writers who are here. They can see the writers and ask them questions. I have made all the writers co-hosts 
so that please turn on your camera, maybe at this point, turn on all, your, all the writers who are in the talk. Please kindly turn on the cameras, don't be shy. And then if someone asks you a question, you can also unmute yourself. I didn't, I, I'm just bouncing this on her own during the last minute, so I don't, don't know whether it is, it is doable, but we'll try. Okay, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhang, uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation of uh, a uh, great uh, landscape of uh, Chinese American writers. I guess uh, we uh, have uh, plenty of time for maybe questions and answers and also maybe discussions. Uh, would you like to invite uh, some of our notables to appear and uh, uh, say a few words? Oh yeah, I guess Jen, I think has to leave soon. So maybe, okay, guess Jen, the, 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 you, you sure. say it yourself. You don't want people to read a thank you, Mr. Nixon, just say something. <laughs> Unmute, unmute. Oh, yes. I was just joking, KK. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so intimidated. Everybody of else so was very, very, very illustrious bios, and one is more distinguished than the next. And I was like, oh my God, now I'm supposed to write, now my, let me, I'm supposed to write, run through my whole resume, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it because I have a little bit of that Chinese, you know. <laughs> well, we still. <laughs> and the reason I actually so I naturally had to say the opposite. <laughs> I, you know, but anyway, but this is a wonderful occasion, KK, and I'm very happy to be able to salute you. Um, I think that you have done a tr you have made a tremendous contribution, um, not just to Asian American literature but to American literature. So um, I, I can't actually believe that you are of an of an age where <laughs> you're ready to retire. I mean, truly, it's a little hard to conceive of, but um, but I certainly wish you all the best. And I just really wanted to be on this call, not to parade my <laughs> accomplishments, um, but to say thank you very much and thank to wish you, you wish you well. And uh, other writers, yeah, uh, please, um, Shirley, Shirley. Uh, As I I, I just feel so honored to be included. And King Kong, you are younger than me, but you have been my model. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no, no. The grace with which you have survived in UCLA uh, and you have contributed to that university um, and the way in which you have made Asian American Pacific Islander and particularly Chinese American literature globally uh, known and acknowledged, and particularly your wonderful trilingualism, Mandarin and Cantonese. I loved it that you read that piece, uh, you know, of Li Pei in Cantonese. It was just so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shirley. And um, I know William Poi Lee is here, right? No, uh, Russell, Russell. <laughs> Who is it? Tell me that you can speak. Oh, Chu Xiaolong is here. Okay, Xiaolong. <laughs> Our Inspector Chen. Wow, how honored. Okay. Do you bring the uh, Italian wine to serve us? Well, Chu Xiaolong has been uh, one of our guest speakers uh, yeah. last year. So this group may not know him, but he's really famous. I think his, uh, his book is translated to every language. And if you go to Paris, the books are prominently displayed in Paris. In the I, most I don't, famous I don't, part of the I, city I or the bookstore. I don't see Xiaolong on camera. Is, is he a... Uh... Xiaolong, can you unmute yourself? Maybe he just, he's not here. Ask to unmute. I'll see whether he's there. Uh, um, Maybe oh, Helen, Helen, Helen Liu is here. Oh, Helen, Helen, please, Helen. <laughs> People call her uh, like a main Helen, 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 please unmute. Um, yeah, hi, KK. Um, just very honored to be here and just overwhelming <laughs> to be introduced by you, um, KK, and, and to be among all these my goodness, all these famous writers. Just in time. I met Helen only about a few months ago, right? <laughs> and, it's such a yeah. beautiful book. But such it's a wonderful talk. Written originally in Chinese and being translated into English. So those of you who can read Chinese, do read it in the original. It's, in Chinese, it's called Yuan Dao Chang Chang. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually uh, attended one of the lectures by uh, Helen recently, uh, maybe uh, from Boston. Uh, 
Oh, right, that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I hope I did okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as uh, right before the lecture, I was still working on the last few pages of the English translation. Hopefully, the English version can be out soon. And um, so, I actually have a question for KK. <laughs> Since you, um, in your presentation at the beginning, you showed one of uh, Marilyn's uh, po poems, right? Uh, playing yeah. with the uh, Li Bai's uh, poem. One of Levi's poems. Um, so I noticed as I've I've been reading, I didn't read that much, but I read some uh, Chinese Americans uh, English works. I noticed that it seems like a distinctive style for many of them to play on words uh, of Chinese poetry and idioms. Would you say that's one of the distinctive styles of Chinese American writers and? Would you advise new writers like me to emulate that? Uh, I will answer it first uh, for Marilyn. Uh, she is extraordinary. Remember, she is in the Academy of American Poets. She is American famous, not Chinese American famous. So what he did, and, and I have to say, you know, I admire her because her use of Chinese is so sophisticated that it's really very hard for mainstream audience to catch. But she's so bold in using a lot of, you know, she also used Chen Xiao, she also used a Wang Wei the Zai Tian. I don't know where all these weird sounds coming from. But anyway, uh, it's very extraordinary. She was going to join us today, but I think she was not good at manipulating the internet. She said that I, I can't get the link or something like that. But um, I won't say that she's typical. She's exceptional in her ability to use Chinese because she actually studied Chinese literature in Amherst. So she has a degree. I forgot whether it's BA, I think it's a master of Chinese literature in Amherst. And she's the one who translated Ai Qing's poetry. She met Ai Qing at U of Iowa, the writing workshop, and she translated Ai Qing poetry. But now China is publishing it without acknowledging that it was translated by Marilyn, publishing Ai Qing in English. So her Chinese is, I think, more sophisticated than any writers that I know. So no, not typical, it's extraordinary, <laughs> yeah. And I think Xiaolong is here now. Hey, Xiaolong? I thought I just saw him. <laughs> now he's disappeared again. Chiu Xiaolong? Here he is. His uh, thing was showing in red. You, uh, Yeah, now I think oh. he's off. 我今天的电脑大概出了什么毛病了，我上不来，然后不听 English， speak in English， because uh, most most of the audience do not， most of the writers do not cannot understand Chinese. Okay, first I want to say I'm sorry. I got there five or ten minutes earlier, but I could not open that. But I won't miss your talk for anything. So that's why He Yong gave me a... Uh... Now back to English anyway. I'm sorry, I, I, I could not get on in time because of my computer problem or something, I don't know. Uh, but finally, He Yong helped me to get on. And I first want to say congratulations for your retirement, right? And uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, for the wonderful talk. And, uh, uh, but can you tell people what, what you plan to do uh, after the, your very successful series of mysteries? Are you planning to keep writing mysteries or you want to go back to poetry? Uh, I think I'm still going to write mystery because my publisher won't let me go if I don't write mystery anymore. I have to kill somebody, right? And But at the same time, I'm not that willing to do that. So that put inspection in a difficult position. And in the meantime, I will still write some poetry. 
So hopefully it's like a balance between the highbrow literature and lowbrow literature. <laughs> Okay, I, I guess uh, Xiaolong uh, have turned off uh, his mic. Uh, do you have other uh, notables to uh, bring on camera? Uh, Russell Liang, Russell Liang. <laughs> My colleague <laughs> and good friend. Russell? Hi. Here he is, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this uh, block party. Uh, it was actually like a party where you have the extensive Chinese menu, uh, like a, you know, buffet, but you only, we only got a little bit. Uh, I want to give one example though. Uh, KK has really been a, br a bridge, a conduit for Chinese and Chinese American writers. Uh, quite a number of years ago, um, we, we planned the first uh, kind of Chinese and Chinese American po poetry reading bilingual in Nanjing, in which uh, KK, Wing Tech Lum, and a number of uh, local uh, Nanjing and uh, poets from uh, Zhejiang and Fuzhou uh, area were involved, and uh, I think uh, KK actually helped to read some uh, poetry in Chinese. Anyway, it was a great, it was a great event. So this is the kind of um, um, on the foot, what, what do you call it, hands-on um, mentorship and uh, bridge building that the KK has done. Uh, through the decades for both Chinese and Chinese American writers. So, okay. Thank you, Russell. But uh, please talk about your work and don't talk about me in future, okay? Uh, Wing Tuck Lum, I, I, I saw Wing Tuck earlier. Is he, are you still here, Wing Tuck? Hello. Wing Tuck. Can you see me? Uh, Wing Tuck Lum, I can't see you. I can't see myself either. <laughs> so I have to. Wing Tuck Lum, can you? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yes, I can see. I can see your screen now. So please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, I think you have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. I'm unmuted, I guess. I can see your video. Uh, can you I turn guess on it, you have to turn, turn on your camera for us to can see. Have you included Winter Lum? Oh, uh, yes, sure. he is here. Okay, great. Okay, you just turn it off again. Um, would you mind just turn back on your camera really quick? Thank you. Yes, that's okay. perfect. Here's Winter. Hi. Congratulations, King Kong. Thank you for inviting me. Actually, I want to introduce Wing Tuck before he talks. <laughs> and it's someone who really deserves it, it, uh, it, uh, introducing because um, I was saving time. But actually, one of greatest uh, Wing Tuck's contributions is not just that he is a stunning poet and, and had, was a poet from time immemorial in, in that I know. That's his, well, he was one of the first uh, Asian American poets I read. But he actually, because he's a businessman, right? So he actually funded a whole journal called Bamboo Ridge in Hawaii that published a lot of Asian American writers including my student, Brenda Kwan, you know, I'm very grateful to Wing Tuck for bringing so many young Asian American writers to print. So thank you, Wing Tuck. I'm glad yeah. to have a chance to say that. Well, I, I, I don't want to take credit for that, but in any case, um, you know, thank you for the recognition uh, for both myself and also for Bamboo Ridge, which is a, a, a local publishing group in Honolulu, Hawaii. Are you going to keep writing to keep being in your prime? Uh, I am writing and I yes. hope to have another book coming out. Wonderful. Possibly here. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, okay. uh, KK, uh, there's a question for you. I, I just wonder if we can okay. squeeze, squeeze okay. Yeah. the question uh, in. Can you Did read I leave the out any writers? Okay, I'll take questions. Uh, or you can ask any of the writers questions too since they're here. Sure, yes. sure. Uh, but the question says uh, you have published. Uh, you published a book in 2017 uh, entitled "The Chinese American Literature Without uh, Borders." Um, you know, um, I heard several times uh, a Chinese professor questioning about this title. 
He said, how could study without a border? I'm not uh, sure whether you heard about this voice and, um, uh, and I'm wondering how you think about this issue about border, border issue. <laughs> okay. Um... I'll just answer it the way I answer my students. Uh, in other words, so many things are without borders, right? You know, we feel that you no know, sex, sexuality, everything is without borders. You know, its borders are defined by human beings. It's not defined by God, right? You know, so I think we have bro broken so many borders because if I keep to the traditional border, uh, for a woman, you know, I'm su not supposed to be a literary professor, right? You know, so who defines the border? So that's my question. So I would like to open literature to everyone, you know, before you know, the IE group, and I love them, they would they make very, very good uh, suggestions, great ideas about racist love in pointing out a lot of problems with America, but they also create a lot of borders. So someone like me would not be considered Chinese American because I came to America when I was already 19, right? So they want people who came very, very young and better still to be born in America to be considered Chinese American. So if I manage to kind of cross the borders within my own field, I feel that why not cross it internationally? Because I think what I want people to appreciate is the literature. As I said, I just enjoy reading this work the way I enjoy reading Shakespeare, not because they are this or that. Then why do we need the title? Because these writers are being neglected by the mainstream and that's why we need the label. But I don't see why we have to kind of define the border so clearly, but I'd love, love to hear what the writers have to say though. So before we also create all these borders as if only things published in the United States or published in Canada should be considered American. But I'm including Siu Gamwan. I'm really grateful that Wang Kai is doing research on Siu Gamwan. He wrote in Spanish and he wrote martial fiction in Spanish. Why isn't he, a, 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 he's in the Americas. So he, to me, is a Chinese American writer. So I don't know whether that answers your friend, but I, I, I feel that we should, our goal, my goal as a human being is to cross borders, not to define borders. I mean, if we can really cross borders freely, there won't be a war today. Why do we always have to have our nation other? Why do we always have the other people? What is the function of borders? <laughs> Maybe you can ask him back. What is the function of borders? And I, I just can't think of. Any other question? <laughs> um, I believe there are some questions on the chat. Uh, okay. And uh, unfortunately, that uh, I think Gish Jen already left. So I think there is another question for Professor KK. Um, it's from Qing Xue. I'm I, apology if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, so he or she or they said, thank you for a lot. Thank you a lot for your beautiful lecture. Could I ask you a question? Why do many Chinese American writers prefer to use traditional China, I guess, oh, instead of modern China as the background to unfold their stories? What do you think? Um, there's a lot of echoes when you are speaking. Uh, Yong, can you repeat the question quickly? No, that, I didn't ask the question. I, I think it was from Qinglan, right? What's oh yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Qinglan, your echo is too strong. You have to go farther. <laughs> I'm going to come to this room. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me better now. So there is a person um, on the chat asking you, um, could I ask you a question? Why do many Chinese American writers prefer to use the traditional China instead of modern China as a background to unfold their stories? Wow, that's a really, really good question. I think it's the same in China. When I was invited to uh, give a talk in um, autobiographical society uh, uh, headed by Wan Li, you know, a, a famous uh, a person, I was really surprised all the autobiography 
they were discussing were autobiographies set in the past. So I believe, and I could be totally wrong, part of the reason is exactly what I was just talking about, that we created so many borders in this world. So there's the US border, there's the Chinese border. Uh, in US, you're not say, supposed to say anything bad about the US. In China, you cannot say anything about China. And yet none of us is perfect. There's no perfect Chinese stories. There's no perfect US stories. But then if you are treading on so many dangerous, the minefield, I would see it, then you know you better say, hey, why don't I set my work in the past? And that's why I admire Bai Xianyong for talking about the present, his Taipei Ren and also his uh, crystal boys. He is talking about the present. He's not setting his work in the past. So I think that's, I don't know what that answers your question, but I think it's too sensitive to set things in the present. I think it, it, it steps on too many people's toes and then um, you're going to be attacked if you set things in the present. That's my understanding. Well, uh, Russell Leong, Phoenix Eyes was set in the, his oh, <laughs> present, you know, a couple of decades ago in, 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 in the present. But um, I think, especially in um, Chinese mainland, it, people are more sensitive. They're more afraid of setting works in the Chinese mainland present because of all the taboos, of all the topics that are very sensitive. My own book that talks about the present has to be, uh, is still not published to this day in Chinese precisely because I talk about the present. So I really understand but I'm not going to change. So I just rather not get published than not being able to talk about the present. But a lot of the chapters on the present has to be modified. And it's being done like over a year. So it's not like quick, easy modification. Any other um, questions? Hancock, there's a question that someone asked um, about Chinese American writers and which of them have uh, written about relationships uh, or reflections of relationships with other ethnicities. And I'd like to add that, you know, Chinese American writers come from all over the world. Uh, they are already a very diasporic people. So I came originally from Malaysia. And so in my writing, all the ethnicities in Malaysia appear in my writing including uh, people from South Asia, Pakistan and India, and of course, uh, people from Southeast Asia, Filipinos and um, Malays, Bumis, uh, and King Kok, I mean, not King Kok, Maxine Hong Kingston in Trip Master Monkey um, has got, you know, a love relationship with uh, between a Chinese American and a white woman. And, um, uh, I'm thinking about um, The Cleaving by Shang Reilly, I think it is, where, you know, there's yeah. a great, you know, Chinese Americans, but there is a love story with a white wife, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to uh, look too far to throw the stone too far to see that Chinese Americans have always been reaching out and incorporating into their bodies and their imaginations what surrounds them in the United States and in their other homelands than mainland China. I would say at least half the, of the writers I'm talking about today write about other ethnicities, a lot of interracial encounters. I, I think it's Jen left, but one, her second book is called Mona in the Promised Land, about how a Chinese, uh, you know, and also intermarriage between a Chinese woman and a Jewish woman in okay. a Jewish family, you know, right. that Mona actually wanted to become Jewish, you know, because of all her Jewish friends. So Russell Leung's stories in Los Angeles is also extremely, totally diverse. So even the, the stories set in Taipei, Phoenix Eyes also have different, the call boys and call girls are a different Asian ethnicity. They are not all Chinese at all. So I would say that most of the writers in the group today, William Hoy Lee, again, is the whole thing about, uh, again, African-American, uh, William Pauly himself, you know, demonstrated in the San Francisco strike, you know, led by African-Americans. 
So within this group of writers today, I think if at least half, if not the majority do write about other groups. And so do I, you know, I, I, I don't teach just uh, Asian American literature. The course I'm teaching right now is called Ways of Reading Race. And Asian American is just a very small portion of that. So I think in order to be really Chinese American, maybe one of the challenges is to really uh, see ourselves as fully American, totally integrated with other majority and minorities. I also don't kind of dismiss that white man, nothing like that. I think all literature should be without borders, that the more you read, the more empathetic you are. You know, just uh, uh, exactly why I like reading a Asian American literature, because it's not confined to one nation, one race, one ethnicity. So that's part of its attraction to me. And now I don't want to confine it to English. I really want to open it up to other language, Japanese, Chinese, Tagalog, you know, Malaysian, you know, and, and I love the fact that you mentioned your Malaysian ancestry because you might be the only one. Malaysia itself is so diverse. So it's just like, if you write about the more specific you are, the more diverse you are. Do not stay in our own borders, Chinatown, right? You know, and I don't think any one of the writers today is like that. There's no, I would say that there's not a single Chinatown author, even though Russell Liao is born and raised in Chinatown, he's as diverse as you can, can be. So. Well, someone asked you a question on the chat okay. about um, the appearance of other kinds of Chinese dialects like Toishin and Taiwanese and um, Cantonese uh, and Hokkien, other than just Mandarin. So I guess you might want to address that question. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I was on a Zoom talk on um, uh, Louis Chu, Eat the Bowl of Tea. Unfortunately, he's no longer in the human world, so he's not included, but that's one of the most uh, brilliant Chinese American novels, it, uh, Louis Chu's Eat the Bowl of Tea. It's used so many wonderful Chinese expressions. Yeah, if I can in, uh, interrupt a bit here, I taught that book very often and the students were always surprised by the way in which he used it. Wow, your mother, wow, your mother, wow, your mother. Yeah, it was so good. And, and of course, nowadays, you know, we are much more open with obscenity. So I tell my students, I say, instead of wow, your mother, it's really F your mother, right? Um, yeah, but and, wow is like a, a Cantonese. Wow is like a walk, right? You know, because the Cantonese equivalent to the F word is using the walk as a, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's very vulgar, but it's very vivid, you know, it's just like, yeah. So, yeah, but people have to have to be not only multilingual, but multi-dialectal to appreciate the, the beauty and diversity and the colorfulness of the language. And even though I'm Cantonese, I have to learn to appreciate Maxine Hong Kingston's Cantonese because it's Toy San, right? It's not the same. And, and William Poiby's uh, Toy San, you know, actually there are more Toy San um, American writers than the, the Hong Kong American writers. So the Hong Kong Cantonese is very different. It's the Sam Yap and Say Yap, right? You know, it's, it's very different. And I just hope that we can all preserve this language. Um, David Wong Louis Pangs of Love is about how the sun, and it's a little autobiographical in the sense that the son cannot communicate with the mother. The son's English is as good as Shakespeare, but the mother <laughs> cannot speak a word of English. So I think as children of immigrants, I think we should all try to learn our mother tongue or father tongue. Thank you so much, um, Professor KK. Um, I mean, in order not to burden uh, Professor Lim because she's been reading the question. So I have an idea in here. Um, if anyone, um, uh, you know, in here today and you would like to ask a question, would you please just raise your hand? Um, once I see you have raised your hand, I can, you know, give you the permission to ask the question yourself. And maybe I think that's easier uh, for you to ask the right question and the question that you want. Thank you. If Wang Kai is here, why don't you, you show your face and talk about how you got so interested in writing about a Peruvian American writer, Kai? Is he here? I think there's a question from Kim about- uh, hey, He's here. Kai is uh, unmuting himself. Right, right. But well, he has a question okay. in the chat. Yeah. 
So Wan Wan Kai is the one who helped. Okay, thank you, KK. Just change your rule. Okay. Wan Kai is in the queue. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I have a question for for KK. Because you know, I, I'm 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 doing a kind of research on on the Beijing image in in the Chinese American literature. Uh, so 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 um, so I know that the UMB has you know uh, has written uh, many things about Beijing. Uh, so do you uh, do you know any other uh, writers who has you know take uh, who has taken Beijing as you know at the sighting? Uh, and also another question, uh, so that is, uh, so would Li Yutang uh, be considered as a Chinese American writer? Okay, uh, both questions are very easy to answer because the first one on Beijing, you met her as Sun Juliana Wang, her very first story is set in Beijing. I think the first Ooh. story, uh, uh, maybe not the very first story, but at least three of her stories are set in Beijing. Uh, uh, could you repeat Wang the Sen, name? The Chinese name is Wang Sun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you met her, right? You, I think you met yeah, her yeah, yeah. at UCLA. Yeah, I audited, so, I audited her, her class. <laughs> okay, very good. So, yeah, so she definitely has worked in Beijing as an interpreter herself, mm -hmm. uh, even though I, I believe she's born in the USA. And, and I've met her father, too, you know, so it's, it's really fun. She's a very good writer, so I really encourage everyone to, to read her work. Uh, the the name of her book is called Home Remedies. Very young writer, but very promising. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is e even easier to, to answer. Yes, I consider Lin Yutang a Chinese American writer, but not Frank Chin. So when earlier mm -hmm. I said that Frank Chin is an arch enemy of Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, Amy Chan and David Henry Huang, the list goes on. Lin Yutang, C.Y. Mm -hmm. Lee, Shirley Lim, <laughs> and me, you know. So, but, uh, so for, for someone like Frank Chin, who is very bright and brilliant, but he would consider uh, someone like Lin Yutang, C.Y. Lee, and um, Jay Snow Wong even, uh, not Jay Snow Wong, but uh, Lin Yutang, C.Y. Lee, Virginia Lee, uh, uh, this, uh, and definitely like people like Zhang Ailing, even though she did not talk about Zhang Ailing, as Americanized Chinese, not Chinese American. Mm -hmm. That because their identity, and he has a point, like their identity is already formed in China, in US. And I think that's how, I feel I am different from American born Chinese as well, because um, growing up in Hong Kong, even though it's a colony, I'm the majority. So I never grew up with thinking that, oh, could I major in Shakespeare? That never crossed my mind. Also, I went to a girl's school, which helped. But I was very surprised coming to America with all these Asian American students telling me when I first got to UCLA, they never expect an Asian person can be teaching, you know, Shakespeare, not to mention that too. And I was the first Asian in the English department. So I do think that a, a certain distinction is important, but not to create a kind of a fast border to say that, no, these are not Chinese American writers. Also because people change, I'm sure He Yong change, right? <laughs> you become very different after 20, 30 years working in the US. You may be very, very Chinese, uh, one of the westernized Chinese, but after 30 years with your kids growing up here, you are much more American than you were 20 years ago, I'm sure, right? You know, so I think people change. So to have any border to, so of course my answer to you is that absolutely. And I think I, I, I'm the one who get Lin Yutang, um, American China book, book back in print because the publisher asked me, should this book be published? I say, of course, there's so few books about Chinatown. Someone, but the people who want to kind of uh, not include him, it's a very funny joke because uh, his first book, they don't like his book, My Country, My People. So in Cantonese, my country, my people, is like selling my country, selling my people. So they consider him a sellout. So I always tell this joke in, in China. So that, that, that's for the people who don't like him. I, I don't share that. Uh, 
uh, idea at all. Because, okay, it's saying that he's catering to American readers, right? It's the same criticism mm -hmm. that Maxine Hong Kingston got. It's the same criticism that David Henry Huang get. So any famous writer, any writer that is accepted by the mainstream, we are seen to be catering. So I think we should really support, you know, how difficult it is for Asian American writers to be published and support people who are published and not to keep putting them down. Oh, and they might, there must be some problem if the mainstream people like them. I think that is a, to me, very, very strange thing. Okay, thank you, KK. Um... Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. So I, I've seen that uh, Hans and, and Matt, Drew, they both have raised their hands. Um, so KK, uh, do yeah, you think- Hans to show his face too, because he's also probably the only person from New Zealand today. <laughs> Hi. Hi, he's an exchange Hi, student at UCLA. Hi Hans, so good yeah. to see you. Hi, so good to see you again. Uh, I do have a question, but you kind of answered this question already, uh, but I'm still gonna ask a question. So first, thanks, KK, for all this remarkable tribute to the notables who have been redrawing and expanding the landscape of world literature, in particular, uh, Asian American literature. So I have a general question uh, for all. So given the distinct history of Asian Americans, like new immigrants, like myself, and Asians from Asia, like New Zealand is part of Asia as well, and Trans-Pacific, and how, how literature presents enlightened or engender each sentiment without submerging one another, like so you kind of answer this question by saying like people changed because we eventually become similar to each other so but is there any other like uh, answers or like feedbacks all right uh, that's my uh, question first of all a correction by saying that people change i am not saying that they become similar it's quite the opposite oh, yeah. i would like to see people change by keeping a lot of themselves. I encourage all my students to really evaluate whoever they are, even the things that make them the most ashamed is what, especially if they want to be a writer, those are the material and that they are the director of their own life. So never simply subscribe to any dominant norms. So it just goes back to this thing about border, you know, every dominant culture is set up such strict borders. So I think the fact that you have been in Shanghai, you've been in LA, you've been in New Zealand, give you so many ways of seeing that allow you to be so much more a fluid person. So I don't want you to simply become a New Zealander, but to become a new kind of New Zealander who can be very tolerant, who can be very inclusive, who does not judge from one cultural point of view or on what is good and bad. So yeah, not to change according to the dominant culture, but change because you know better. That's my, yeah. And what is the second question? Cynthia, oh, Cynthia is here too. Cynthia, you want to show your face to all these old friends? Cynthia, I think, is asking her question from uh, uh, from 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 Guangzhou, right? Is that the Cynthia? Yeah, Cynthia. Yes. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, yes. Yeah, so oh, I'm, you're, I'm, not I'm, Cindy. I'm, Cynthia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm so glad to see you again. I just have a question about uh, realistic style. Uh, you know, because when I was reading Levine, uh, she kind of suggested. Uh, the realistic style is very important because our networks are boundless. And so there are always unforeseen forces in a person's life, right? Like uh, the, the COVID pandemic happens. Um, and so I also kind of like remember somebody said, um, you know, like, for example, like uh, Toni Morrison's um, Beloved. Actually, it's kind of just a you know, a tweet uh, kind of changes some of the realistic figures into ghosts and everything. Um, just because the realistic style has been kind of like written so well by some of the uh, predecessors. So I just, I, I guess my question is, in your opinion, uh, what is the position of realistic writing style now? 
And what's this relationship to other genres or all other writing styles, if I can use that uh, kind of amateur terminology? Thank you so much. Um, to me, I think a good writer can move between the two realms very well. And some stories might work better realis told realistically. Other stories work better um, surreal. I don't know what's the word for it, and more imaginatively. So for instance, one of the story that was extremely moving that I cited was the story called Hunger by Len Samantha Chang. And that story is told from the ghost of the mother who saw how a tiger father kind of really messed up the lives of not one daughter, but two daughters, because he's a very loving and good father, but he projected his own failure. He's a talented violinist. And then he was hoping that both of these daughters, he, he didn't make it. He, he could have been like the top violinist in the US and his own family disowned him because he studied violin as opposed to studying medicine or something. So the family in China disowned him. So the whole tragedy kind of carried through to the next generation, right? And then he tried to warn the daughter to devote all his time, her time playing the violin. And the first daughter was tone deaf and therefore she, he totally neglected her because she's not his dream. So I think a story told from a realistic point of view would almost be somehow too painful, too, too indigestible, whereas to be told from this ghost point of view is so much more haunting. Is more digestible and more haunting. So I think that in that story, even though the story is so real to me, I can just see men like that. I can see women like that, just projecting you know, their ambition onto their kids and, and really messing up their lives as a result. So it's a very good lesson, very realistic lesson, but it can only be told um, unrealistically. Oh, I heard that Ha Jing is now in the art. So we definitely have to see this writer because it's not easy for Chinese audience to see him for reasons I won't explain. Uh, ha Jing? Ha, ah, yeah, ha. Ah. Sorry. Please, to please uh, you uh, uh, unmute yourself and also show the, the picture. Oh, I saw his face. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. I, okay, I, I, so I, I myself to... finally, it took me a while to figure out how to handle this. Okay, Thank so, you for doing I'm this so honored that you're here with us. I'm, yeah. I'm really delighted. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, KK. I, I, I don't know whether I should congratulate you on the retirement or I feel bad because... Oh, uh, I'm, keep, I'm going to keep uh, teaching, don't worry. Oh, well, that's good, that's good. That's, <laughs> yeah. good news. that's great news. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, thank you for this wonderful lecture. It's so rich make me think a lot about it. You know, whenever uh, I meet so many people, especially so many writers, I ever think to reposition myself in a way, shift a little bit. Uh, it's wonderful. In fact, I, I, I'm going to uh, get a copy of the, the book, uh, uh, A Journey to Ithaca. It sounds very uh, wonderful. How come I still see you? Oh, right. You, you, yeah, see if I'm going to see you. No, but uh, maybe you can help me answer the question someone asked earlier. Why are so many Chinese writers setting their work in the past, like Lisa C, and not in the present? It's absolutely not true of Ha Jing. All his work is set in the present. But as far as I know, many of his works are unavailable in China, even if they have one major award. So I don't want to want to talk about this, uh, but it is a very real problem um, that I, I, even as a critic, I'm facing that, you know, when there are so many borders about what is like a good Chinese story, because to me, a good Chinese story is that you write like Shakespeare. So a good mm -hmm. story is when you have complexity. Shakespeare can make Macbeth into a sympathetic figure. So if it's a good story is to say that everything is good about Donald Trump, it would be a horrible story. Can you imagine, you know, <laughs> to have a story in which we can only say good things about Donald Trump? So how do we do that? Or Putin, you know, 
So, so what is a good story? So I, I think we have to redefine. I think a literary way of defining a good story is very different from a political way of defining a good story. That's why I don't touch politics. I stay out of it. I don't, I don't even talk with Russell on Trump. I say, you, you talk about it. <laughs> I'd rather stay, stick to my writers. Yeah, excuse me, but didn't Hajin write a wonderful book on Li Pei? He buys, yeah. Non-fiction, non-fiction, yes. That's yes, not- but, but, but that's a wonderful book, Hajin. I want to congratulate oh. you. It's a marvelous, marvelous biography. And anyone who has not read it need to go to Amazon.com and buy a copy immediately. And oh, surely. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to see you after so many years. We met at Harvard uh, many, many years ago. Uh, Sure, yes. Uh, you know, because my wife has been ill in recent years, and so I couldn't write fiction uh, novels for some years. But uh, for nonfiction, especially Bay, it's less a challenge because his life was there. <laughs> so I just did, did the research and, and did the work chapter by chapter. But on, but on the other hand, it's very hard to, to think, to imagine how to end the book. That's why I decided on the granddaughters. It's kind of heartbreaking to see such a, a, a genius, a, a really a great, a great man of letters. But the end, his descendants were illiterate. So thank you so much. I'm so glad you liked the book. Really, I didn't. <laughs> I saw one of my students, UCLA undergrad student, who is only 22, so I have to call on him because I want to brag about what wonderful students we have at UCLA. Madeline, are you there? Uh, can yeah. you show your face? Unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I've been here for um, the entire lecture, but um, like my name was changed, so like I followed the entire lecture. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question and raised a hand because um, so the majority of the questions are from a literary critic's perspective, which is really wonderful because we need um, like literary criticism and um, re-evaluations of the wonderful works to make it um, kind of more known to more people. But I would like to ask a question from um, a writer's perspective, uh, as I am planning to be a writer very um, soon, if possible. So, so yeah, I get the, the sense of empowerment of how these Asian American writers would write um, without borders to not only demonstrate um, the like socialistic or the the large scheme of Asian American development, but also the uh, the kind of very subtle human humanitarian details of those who are taking pride or suffering from the perspectives of individuals. So I was wondering what would be considered a like good book in the future? What are the future traits that um, like very established writers and critics like you would um, say is a good book or is the domain whereby in future we should strive to reach? Thank you. Uh, that, that one, maybe before I answer your question, I want to tell people about the student. I actually invited him to write an afterword for my own book in Chinese because my book is being translated. And then he is the one who is uh, writing the afterword. Not only that, I also um, asked Medwin to modify my chapters on Russell Leung that is seen as problematic for publication. So he can change a lot of things into using the oldest Chinese Dian Gu that I don't know, okay? He would know so many Dian Gu that I don't know. So he was also instrumental. If my book ever get published in Chinese, it was a, a lot of credits goes to Matt Wen. So I just want to say that. And he's also a person who crosses a lot of borders because he is a triple major. He's a triple major in physics in lingu- and not, no, no, he switched from linguistics to English. So. So physics, uh, comlit, and English. So he's going to graduate with three majors uh, next year. And in the meantime, I have tried to talk him out of 
majoring in English because I say, Matt, when your Chinese is so good and you would really did do really marvelous thing, you know, doing comedy using your Chinese. But English, even though your English is better than most students, but to be to actually get a PhD in English, your English cannot be just good. It has to be really great and exquisite. And I don't think you were quite there yet. Well, I think that provoked him. He said, well, I have to prove to yourself that my English is, is there. So what happened is that uh, two days ago or three days ago, I told him that, hey, there's this thing I know about uh, Bai Shi Zhuan uh, that was very bizarre because when I read John Keats' Lamia, I said, how come the story could be so... So he was in my office, right? I said, oh, is this tell I don't know why I was talking about John Keats, but I said, well, it's one of, oh, I think I told him when I first got to Berkeley, I actually want to be a romantic poetry person because I love John Keats. And Lamia was, how can two stories very complicated be so similar? So I did a lot of research, but because I dropped, I left my field of uh, Renaissance, I left my field of uh, romantic poetry. I never do anything about it. I've to I told a lot of Chinese scholars this uh, coincidence. And then Lemmy was, uh, 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 Melvin was in my office immediately said, okay, I, I, he was reading the poem in my office. I say, it's a very long poem, just read it at home. So he went home and then yes, uh, and then two days ago, he sent me a poem. He said, this poem is inspired by Lemmy, asked me to read it. And then I say, I have to give a talk today. Can you, you know, I, I said, I don't want to skip it. And then I read it. I thought, Matt Wen, how did overnight you really enter the Parnassus that you all of a sudden become such a good English poet that before I thought, well, your English is not quite there. So I just want to say that this is not just, uh, don't, don't underestimate him. Uh, don't be ageism on the other hand. He's 22, but he's a, I, I think I do hope that he will become a, a future writer, if not already a very good writer. So, um, so now you guys can answer his question. How do you, what would be a good book a hundred years from now? What do you consider a good books hundred years from now? Or, yeah, or like basically in future, how would like very established critics like you expect us to write? Like generally, what should we write about? Like how Exactly should... different from what has been written before, but at the same time inspired by what is, has gone on before. Maxine Hong Kingston is not Maxine Hong Kingston without learning the chant of Wu Lan Si, right? And then Marilyn Chin is not Marilyn Chin without studying all that Chinese tongue and song poetry. So you already have so lucky, you know, you already have all that repertoire in you. So I would say, you know, to study, to read more. And I remember hearing Ha Jing give a talk and he said he, during the Cultural Revolution, he was stuck with uh, Thomas Hardy or someone like that. But that also really formed the basis of him being a good writer, reading these works so deeply, a good writer deeply. So it's not to discriminate against writers, you know, really read as many good works as you can. And then keep writing. I think as long as you keep writing, you'll become better and better. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we can have some of the writers answer that. Uh, KK, uh, we, our time is up. Uh, I know. Yeah, maybe okay. we can end the question and answer session uh, on this note. Uh, do you have any uh, closing remarks <laughs> to make? No, I'm just so, so delighted that so many of my uh, colleagues, so many writers, especially, and friends are here. And I, I wish that I can, they can all reveal their faces. Maybe we can have a photo have a gallery photo with all the faces? Is that possible? Or no? uh, can Ching Nan take care of that? I don't <laughs> know. Nan, can, you, can you have everyone unveil themselves, including yourself? Oh, yes. Um, I, already, I already did the setting. So everybody, please. Oh, they're doing oh, Jonathan Hart is here. <laughs> uh, so me, you're um, oh, I want to say something about Jonathan Hart. Jonathan Hart is publishing the latest poems by uh, Russell Young and Marilyn Chen. And I committed myself to writing on Russell Leung's latest work called uh, Zhuo in um, Angel City. Okay, so it's a graphic, a graphic poem. So, and uh, yeah, I see so many great people here. So I'm so sorry I didn't, didn't can't so get Qingnan, to have you taken the picture already? And Susan <laughs> Egan is here. 
I try to get Bai Xianyong to come too. <laughs> he said he doesn't know how to use Zoom. <laughs> but tell him what I said about him. <laughs> okay. So are we done with the photo taking? Uh, just a second, just a second. I'm trying to make, um, I'm trying to have more people show on the first page so, so more people can be included. Um, Do you meanwhile. want the audience to appear as well? Yes, 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 yes. Then you and have Xiao, to... Xiao Xu, Xiao Xu, hey, He Yong, this one, Xiao Xu is from Nanjing. Okay. She's <laughs> a Xiang. key student. Yeah, Lao Xiang. Yeah. Hey, Xiao Xu. Uh, Nice to meet you. Okay, I've taken one. Um, really nice one, I think. Only if uh, if uh, Quan can stop hiding her beautiful mouth, and I is can. Is Emily take... here? Yeah, I think Emily is here as well. Okay, please. These are all my goddaughters. <laughs> they have to show show up. <laughs> Okay, so oh hi guys, I'm here. Um, so I'm gonna take another one with myself included. Um, everybody say um, Asian. <laughs> Asian. Fine. Okay, I would just say it myself. Okay, cool. Let's do another one. Another one. Okay. Thank you guys. Kwame. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me Sorry. just. Let me just make an announcement for our next lecture, uh, which will be on May the 28th. So the topic is on Wellington Gu, uh, the top diplomat uh, uh, for the Republic of China. And the speaker is Professor Jing Guang Yao of Fudan University. So you're all welcome. Can you send us uh, the, the, the link, the Zoom link? Sure. What the okay, the QR code is the link. Uh, but if okay, I have your nice. contact information, uh, I'll be happy to send you the the link as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much, KK, and uh, yeah. thank you all the writers. Oh, <laughs> I think. Oh, at summer, I just want to introduce last minute. Summer Kim Lee will be teaching what I'm teaching. I think a wonderful, wonderful new high at UCLA. So you can see her name, Summer here. Summer, can you show your face so people can recognize you? And she is doing the most uh, crossing borders work. So it'd be a, uh, I, I really am happy that we have someone in the English department uh, who can teach Asian American literature. I know we already have Rachel Lee, but she's already split so many ways with the women's studies. And, and all that. So it's wonderful that uh, we have uh, Summer Kim Lee now. Summer, uh, I, I guess it's too late to, she must not co host, so she cannot unveil herself. But, okay. uh, thank you so much. Bill. Sure, sure. I, I guess we'll have an opportunity uh, in the future. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good night and uh, good morning uh, if you're in China and other places. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you. Very nice meeting you, you. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful thank you. retirement present for me. Thank mm -hmm. you, Hyo. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. <clears throat>